Snus Drunk. I remember first seeing the title, Rise of the Phoenix, a while back and thinking, Whoa, that sounds awesome! And the cover has a couple badass looking dudes about to fight. So, what is this? A fighting game with weapons? A feudal Japan themed beat em up? A hack and slash adventure type thing like Secret of Mana? Nope, it's a Koei game, and I'm not gonna lie, that's when my interest pretty much evaporated. But, now that I've recently been playing games like Liberty or Death and PTO, I feel like I'm in a good spot to take a look at Rise of the Phoenix, released in February 1995 for the Super Nintendo, and you guessed it, it's a PC port originally made for the PC-9801. I say this with nothing but respect for Koei and their fans, but Jiminy Christmas, so many of their games look and play exactly the same. But I've come up with my own sliding scale of Koei-ness that differentiates everything. Like for example, if you want maximum Koei, go with the Pacific Theater of Operations games. They got menus on top of choices with more options and settings than you can shake a stick at. If you want a less dense Koei game that's a little more action-based, then go with Enindo Way of the Ninja. If you find the history subject matter too dry, then you go with Gem Fire. Rise of the Phoenix is somewhere in between. It's a historical simulation, and it's a little closer to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms series, so there's plenty of tactical stuff here at your disposal, but you don't get bogged down in the minutia of stuff like, I don't know, what kind of facial hair your 99th Battalion has, or what Carly Simon songs a certain officer likes, or whatever, I don't know. Since Rise of the Phoenix was ported well into the Super Nintendo's lifespan, this game has a bit of polish to it. There's a ton of different story sequences featuring some sharp-looking pixel art, it's compatible with the SNES mouse, and the music throughout the game is also high quality. Rise of the Phoenix has more personality than most SNES Koei games. There's lots of snippy dialogue and sneering character portraits, so on the overall Koei scale, this game is closer to Uncharted Waters New Horizons, which is a friggin' fantastic game by the way. Rise of the Phoenix isn't quite in that category, but it's still a good playthrough. This time around, the story takes place around 200 BC, or about 400 years before the start of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms era, covering the beginnings of the Han Dynasty. China's first emperor, Shi Huangdi, is dead, so now it's everyone for themselves, with two prominent warriors rising to the forefront. Zhang Yu has great combat stats with low charisma, and Liu Bong has high charisma with low combat. In other words, with one guy you just fight everything yourself, and the other guy you recruit help from other places. But yeah, those are the only two warlords that you choose from when you play this one, with the goal of course being to mercilessly annihilate your opponent and conquer China. Too bad you can't play as this warlord, although he'd probably get squashed in about 30 seconds. Believe it or don't, the gameplay is kinda sorta different. Yeah, there's a lot of the same old Koei stuff here, as you can see. You still go back and forth between a planning phase and a moving phase, and there's a total of 39 different cities you can conquer that fall into categories of commercial, military, barrier, and capital cities, but things are at least arranged in a more player-friendly way, and the focus is narrowed down a bit. For one thing, there's only four scenarios to complete, and there's also barely any city management here. Cash flow isn't as big of a deal since gold is automatically paid to your generals, and the game just isn't nearly as difficult as other Koei titles. You can tell a real effort went into making this particular game a little less complicated. Combat is also a bit different. Battles can take place in either an open field or in a city, and they can last up to 15 in-game days, split up into three turns per day. But generals in this game aren't controlled by players. Instead, you send envoys to either make friends with other lords, or if they refuse, you just kick the crap out of them until they're your friend. What's cool is that if you do this too much, sometimes cities will form an alliance against you, so you can't just bulldoze your way through the game with brute force. When it comes to the battle screen, each unit gets a fixed number of points, which helps give battles a little more focus and direction and keeps them from going on forever, if nothing else. There's also one-on-one -on -one fighting, when you can challenge another lord to a duel. You can surprise enemy camps by sneaking in and raiding them at night. You can divert rivers to flood enemy fortresses. You got the usual weather stuff to deal with, and you also have plagues to avoid. This may not be as dense as other games of its kind, but there's still plenty of stuff you gotta deal with. So yeah, Rise of the Phoenix is a bit of a surprise in that it's a Koei game that's actually playable today even if you're not into games like this. It may be more streamlined and accessible than their other titles, but there's still a lot of things to manage. It just doesn't crush you with a mountain of superfluous details. 
Koei is really kind of its own genre in that you can really only compare Koei games with other Koei games, so where does Rise of the Phoenix rank? I think it's a solid playthrough, definitely the most player-friendly out there on the Super Nintendo. It's not quite as good as stuff like Uncharted Waters, but I'd definitely rather play it than other Super Nintendo Koei ports like Operation Europe and Nobunaga's Ambition. If you've ever been curious about Koei games, I think Rise of the Phoenix is worth a look. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day!